For those of you who've been following me for a while, yes, I cut my hair. For those of you who haven't been following me for a while, let me make one thing perfectly clear. I love the Beatles. After all, I played George Harrison in the Broadway show Let It Be. The Beatles are the reason I started playing guitar in the first place. I've practically got most of their songs memorized. Abbey Road and Revolver are up there with my favorite albums of all time. There are other songs that would compare to masterpieces from Bach or Beethoven. But even with their immense quality control, the Beatles have to have some worst songs just by default. Speaking of Beethoven, I remember going to see a performance of his second symphony, often considered his worst one, and the conductor saying Beethoven wrote nine incredible symphonies, so one of them has to be the worst. Wow, that made me excited to hear the symphony. But I think he was right, and I think it's best to think of this list in the same way. I mean, if you've got a catalog with gems like Strawberry Fields, Something, Here, There, and Everywhere, obviously some songs like Maybe Love Me Do are gonna come off as a little bit trite, which is why I have a couple provisions to this list. Number one, it has to have been written by the Beatles. It can't be a cover song. It has to have been written by Lennon McCartney or George Harrison or Ringo Starr or all of them. Although I will agree with John Lennon that A Taste of Honey should have been renamed A Waste of Money. Number two, it has to come from one of their officially released albums while they were still a band. So it can't come from the anthology or a bootleg. Anything from Please Please Me to Let It Be, any singles or b-sides from 1962 to 1970, basically any original song from this box set are all fair game. Number three, I'm gonna go a little easier on some of their earliest work. Like I said, I think it's a little hard to judge their writing from Please Please Me up to something like Sgt. Pepper. This doesn't mean I won't choose anything from their early work, but I just think it's best to judge it on what they were making at the time or their back catalog. With all that being said, let's take a look at the 10 worst Beatles songs by default. So I asked my fans to comment on what they considered to be the worst Beatles songs, and they certainly didn't let me down, pun. One that honestly surprised me with the amount of people who commented on it was the song Dig It from Let It Be. I guess I can see why, it's just not really much of a song. It's just a snippet of a jam they decided to include in the album. It's really the same riff looped over and over again. Uh, Lennon just sings a bunch of nonsense lyrics and it just doesn't even feel like a real song. Although I think you will see that that's kind of a reoccurring theme on this list. To be honest, I wasn't going to include this because there's already a number of studio outtakes all over Let It Be, so it's not like it breaks up the flow of the record. I actually feel like Her Majesty undercuts the beauty of the Abbey Road medley, but it's become such a legendary part of the album, it's hard to count it as a worst song. Also, be thankful they chose to include it more as an afterthought, rather than putting it slapdag in the middle of the medley, which would have really ruined the flow. As for Dig It, I guess I can include it as my number 10 slot. I still don't really consider it all that bad, but like I said, these are the 10 worst by default. The next song was not influenced by my fans' comments, although a couple people did mention it, and it is one that I always had a bit of an issue with. Number nine, Run For Your Life. This is the final track on the UK release of Rubber Soul, written by John Lennon, and very atypical for a Beatles song. I mean, the first line of the song is, I'd rather see you dead, little girl, than to be with another man. Oh, that would go over well in 2020. But even as a kid, I was always scratching my head at the abuse of undertones of the lyrics. And look, I'm not expecting every single Beatles song to be All You Need Is Love or I Wanna Hold Your Hand. I mean, hell, even a lot of John songs on Rubber Soul have a very melancholic feel to them, but Run For Your Life just sticks out like a sore thumb. And there's even something a little bit off about the melody. John actually regretted writing this number, calling it his least favorite Beatles song. Though it should be noted that John was very critical about a lot of Beatles songs. Now the reason it's low on my list is despite the lyrics, it's still a pretty cool upbeat rock and roll tune. I mean, they've got their classic signature harmonies on the chorus, George plays some really cool guitar lines, I like the slide in it. You know, it, it almost sounds like if it had been a Rolling Stones song, it would have worked. Like, that would have been interesting if they had given it to them to record. Hell, if it was a Slayer song, nobody would have batted an eye. 
But still, it's just kind of a strange way to end one of their most loved albums. Though I guess if this is the worst of the 14 songs on Rubber Soul, it only shows you how much quality control they had at this point. Number eight, You Like Me Too Much. Sorry, George, even you're not safe from this list. A few Harrison songs were commented on, including Blue Jay Way, Only a Northern Song, even his first song, Don't Bother Me, which I've always personally liked. It's his first song, you can't judge him too much for his first try. But by his third try on the album Help, which also included the impressive I Need You, which he performed in the movie, You Like Me Too Much almost sounds like a parody of a Beatles song, like something the Ruddles would have done. It's only 2 minutes and 40 seconds, but it feels really long and disjointed. And unlike Run For Your Life, it doesn't have any memorable guitar lines, just this kind of corny honky-tonk piano. There's not really that much else to say about the song. It's actually one of the only songs that George wrote for the Beatles that I really don't care for. I guess I'm not a huge fan of Blue Jay Way either, but I do find some of the weird production to be kind of cool. It really goes to show you just how strong George's output is if You Like Me Too Much is the only filler among them, and there's certainly worse filler than that. Now, sticking with 1965, there's a pair of songs that came out that year that were in contention for this list. The first was It's Only Love from Help. John Lennon was also critical of the song, calling it lousy with abysmal lyrics. Though again, I wouldn't take his criticisms to heart. He actually said Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds was terrible. Can't agree with that, but I do see what he has to say about It's Only Love. Every time I hear those weird guitar parts that start the song, I just want to skip the track. The other was a B-side called Yes It Is, which John Lennon wrote as a sort of sequel to this boy. Even John admits it didn't quite work. There's a lot of things about this song I admire. I mean, I like the complex harmony arrangements. I think George's volume swells on the guitar are a nice touch. I mean, you really do have to give him credit for trying something really intricate. But the truth is that It's Only Love still had a chorus that you could sing along to. Yes It Is just doesn't have a strong hook. It's definitely missing the harmonic magic of this boy. And despite the complexity, the harmonies really aren't all that together, the lyrics are pretty dull, so Yes It Is is my number seven pick. So, you know, so far most of these songs don't really offend me in any way, but I gotta warn you, these next ones really do kind of get under my skin. Number six, Obla oh, Dee Obla oh, Da. <sighs> Look, I know a lot of people really like this song, but Obla Dee Obla Da has always been one of my least favorite songs, even as a kid. And for the longest time, I could never quite figure out why. But after reading Jeff Emmerich's book, it started to make sense. John got in a really intense argument with Paul while recording the White Album, calling Obla Dee more of his granny shit. John didn't like this song, oh blah dee, oh blah da. am I correct? Who says? The story goes that John banged out that opening piano part in the studio while he was stoned out of his mind. I guess that's why the opening piano riff always felt so weird. Like the song is making fun of itself. George also threw a dig at the song in Savoy Truffle. Apparently they spent so much time in the studio trying to make this track work, the recording engineer Jeff Emmerich left the sessions while they were doing it. And you can really hear it if you listen to the song close enough. The magic's just not there, and the band is just not into it. I'm glad I'm not the only person who thought along the same lines. I thought I probably would have included it higher on this list, but listening to it again, I don't think I can. It's still well recorded, Paul and Ringo lay down a tight groove. I do enjoy some of uh, George Martin's horn arrangements, I actually think the bridge is pretty good. It just, it takes me a while to get into it. You know, again, if you like the song, great. Keep listening to it, enjoy it, it's just not my thing. Number five, not a second time. Okay, even though I said I'd be easy on some of their early material, this one just can't be ignored. It's from With The Beatles, although I used to listen to it on Meet The Beatles, it's the last track, and it's just a rare miss for them. I mean, obviously they're trying to write another Smokey Robinson type tune, but the harmonic structure makes no sense, it doesn't really sound like there's any kind of hook or really a chorus, and George Harrison isn't even on the track. Instead, George Martin plays what's gotta be the most boring piano solo on a Beatles song. I've heard that they needed another track to fill out this album and Lennon and McCartney just rushed this one out. The only thing I find kind of interesting about Not A Second Time is it almost sounds like inspiration for Kurt Cobain's writing, because I know he was a big fan of this album. Maybe as a slow grunge number it would've worked. Oh, not a second time. 
But here, it just doesn't. You know, I'm starting to realize my Kurt Cobain impression doesn't seem quite as authentic with the short haircut. Here's one that no one commented on. Number four, honey pie. I know, I'm not talking about wild honey pie. We'll get to that in a minute. This is regular honey pie. Paul wrote so many of these schmaltzy show tune type songs. Sometimes they worked great. When I'm 64 off of Sgt. Pepper is a classic. Martha My Dear is a beautiful number from the White Album. And who doesn't love an upbeat song about a serial killer like Maxwell Silverhammer? Yeah, I, I know I'm contradicting myself considering what I said about Run For Your Life, but at least Maxwell is self-aware and it, you know what, never mind. I still do not like Honey Pie and Honestly, as much as I love the White Album, Side 4 is where I start to tune out. For an album where Paul sings some of his greatest vocals, from the heavy metal screaming in Helter Skelter to the soft beauty of Blackbird, Honey Pie is really deserving of John's granny music put down. But John's not off the hook either. That solo he plays in the, in the middle is... Well, it's not even really a solo. The only thing I kind of like are George Martin's uh, orchestral arrangements, and I would really like to hear them on their own, but then Paul starts singing in what I can only describe as a Tiny Tim impression. I mean, I won't knock him. I'm sure Paul had a lot of fun writing these Roaring Twenties big band numbers, but I had a really miserable time listening to it. And would you believe that this is not the worst song with the words Honey Pie in it off of the White Album? Number three, Wild Honey Pie. Oh yeah, this one got a lot of comments. Much like Dig It, it's so short and repetitive, it doesn't even feel like it should be counted as a song, but it is so much worse on the ears. Paul is the only Beatle to appear on this track since everyone was in different studios working on individual material. There's not much to say. It's just pure cacophony. I mean, there's admittedly a lot of interludes throughout the White Album, but since this is its own individual track, we have to judge it as one. Honestly, it almost sinks the White Album for me, considering it follows Obla D, and Bungalow Bill doesn't really do it any favors. Thank God While My Guitar Gently Weeps and Happiness is a Warm Gun get us back on track. Yeah, you all got it right on this one. Unless you're a diehard or some avant-garde hipster who thinks hacking up hairballs is music, which might include the entirety of Brooklyn, Wild Honey Pie is a track you can skip. Now, before we get into the two worst songs on my list, let's look at what some other people said, which might include some honorable mentions. Strangely enough, another Rubber Soul track got a lot of attention, the Ringo sung number, What Goes On, which he actually co-wrote with Lennon and McCartney, his first writing credit, I believe. It's not a great song by any means, it's actually pretty sloppy, but I don't think it's that bad either. Quite a few Ringo songs got attention, and would you believe I don't have a single Ringo song on this list? Sorry, Ringo haters. Yellow Submarine I was expecting, and I'm honestly surprised it didn't get more attention. I guess a lot of fans are just nostalgic for the movie like I am. I was sad to see Octopus's Garden get some attention because I actually really like that song. By far the best song Ringo wrote for the band. Don't Pass Me By makes a little more sense, but come on, it's got one of the greatest lines ever. I'm sorry that I doubted you. That was so unfair. You were in a car crash and you lost your hair. And see, what's interesting about that lyric is it makes you think, did she lose her hair because of the car crash? Or were these two separate incidents that led... Speaking of Yellow Submarine, All Together Now was also considered for this list, but it's meant to be a kid-friendly song, and it kind of succeeds in that regard. You Know My Name, Look Up the Number was also considered, but I kind of get a kick out of how silly the song is. Flying is definitely a weird song, but it's kind of interesting to hear the Beatles play an instrumental. There were a couple suggestions that just made no sense to me. Hello, goodbye? I mean, okay, it's kind of cheesy, but it's still pretty fun, especially the vamp, which they improvised on the spot. Within You Without You, that's one of my all-time favorite Beatles songs. Hell, even John considered it one of his favorites. Hey, Jude. I am the walrus. I want you, she's so heavy. 
The Lawn and Winding Road came close to be considered. Like Obladi, I always used to dislike this song, and later found out it was a point of contention for Paul and producer Phil Spector, who added all the overblown orchestration on it. But then I watched the movie, heard the naked version, and I realized what a beautiful tune it was. Even the schmaltzy version I can't bring myself to include on the list. I just wish the naked version had been released to begin with. But here's one that no one suggested, and it has long been one of my most hated songs in their catalog. Number two, The Ballad of John and Frickin' Yoko. When I was a kid, just the title, The Ballad of the John and Yoko, really made me cringe, and I had a sense of dread listening to it for the first time. Now, you might think I dislike the song because it's about Yoko, and maybe that was my initial hesitation about listening to the song, but Yoko was the inspiration behind many of John's greatest songs, Happiness is a Warm Gun, Don't Let Me Down, Woman off of Double Fantasy. But this song is just not in contention with any of those gems. You know, the first time I heard it, it left no impact on me whatsoever. It felt really wordy, but not in a unique way like I'm the Walrus or Revolution. Uh, you know, basically the lyrics are a retelling of John and Yoko's wedding and their uh, bed and demonstration. You know, a fun idea, but it just gets redundant after a while. It just goes on and on and on. It's only three minutes, but it feels like it's more. You know, it's obviously the most self-referential Beatles song, and much like Run For Your Life, it just feels like it doesn't belong in the Beatles catalog. Also, the chorus and the line, you're gonna crucify me, makes me pretty uncomfortable knowing what happened to John later on. To top it off, this is maybe one of the sloppiest Beatles recordings ever. John was insisted on rushing the song out as quickly as possible. George and Ringo couldn't even make it to the recording session. John's playing all the guitar parts, and some of those lead lines get a little bit repetitive. Paul handles all the rhythm section instruments, including drums, and it just doesn't feel like it has much of a pocket. While I was never a fan of it, I completely lost my taste for it when I was forced to play it at cover gigs and obviously Beale's tribute shows. I've never understood why so many people like this song so much, but then again, there's probably plenty of Beatles songs I really like that people are like, well, why do you like that song so much? I thought maybe my distaste for the Ballad of John and Yoko would have simmered down by now, but it's actually gotten worse. I mean, I guess I can't say it's technically the worst song of their catalog, but it's my personal least favorite of theirs. But now we come to number one, and the number one worst Beatles song ever is Revolution 9, which probably comes as a shock to no one. This was by far the most commented song, though some of them rightfully said it isn't even really a song. At least Dig It and Wild Honey Pie are still technically songs with lyrics and melodies. Revolution 9 is just some weird, avant-garde, heroin-driven experiment that John and Yoko concocted, splicing tape loops together, not unlike their Trilogy of Noise albums. And, you know, while John, I remember John saying the song Let It Be had nothing to do with the Beatles, this literally has nothing to do with the Beatles. And, you know, while a lot of people did rightfully comment that this shouldn't even be counted as a song. I think Tristan Lane said it best. Hopefully I'm saying that name correctly. It takes up so much precious space on the White Album. Wild Honey Pie might be worse, but imagine nine minutes of that. And that's spot on. This is eight minutes and 22 seconds of just pure randomness. In place of this song, they could have included George is Not Guilty, John's Child of Nature, an early version of Jealous Guy. Hell, they could have put Hey Jude in place of Revolution 9, and it still wouldn't have been as long. But, as much as I dislike this song, and it is technically the worst Lennon McCartney credit on their catalog, it's still objectively not really that bad. I have to admit, the first time I heard it, I did find it kind of interesting, and the repetitive loop, number nine, has become something of a well-known gag in pop culture. Number eight? Uh. Number eight? Uh. In fact, because of that Simpsons joke, that's how I found out about the song and the band. My dad explained the reference by playing the record, so technically Revolution 9 was my introduction to the Beatles. Which is really sad the more you think about it, but 
That's kind of the charm about the Beatles. They took chances. They could have easily just kept writing She Loves You over and over again, but they wanted to push the envelope as much as possible. Sometimes it didn't always work, but when it did, you got gems like Tomorrow Never Knows, Penny Lane, Revolution, and Here Comes the Sun. Sometimes you need an Obla Di Obla Da to appreciate what a gorgeous tune Dear Prudence is. I found it much more interesting to listen to the Beatles do something really out there than listen to some safe formulaic pop tune that the record company just manufactured. If these are the worst songs the Beatles put out, then I'd say their body of work is among the greatest in rock and roll history. So those are my picks. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and I should probably start rehearsing for my next Beatles gig. They actually just sent me a set list. I wonder what we're gonna do.